Okay, it's time. It is 11.05. Let's get started on our final session of Identifying Your Catholic Ancestors Genealogy Workshop Series, which we have been presenting in partnership between the City Archives, New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, and the Archdiocese of New Orleans Office of Archives and Records. Today, we're going to be exploring cemeteries in cemetery exploration, identifying burial locations. In this session, uh, my wonderful colleagues at New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries and the Archdiocese of New Orleans Archives and Records will give concrete examples of cemetery research so you can experience a ser various searches from start to finish or to as far as they can get. So let us begin. This is, of course, just to reiterate, the sixth session of our six-week Zoom collaboration between my office, the City Archives and Special Collections, which are housed at New Orleans Public Library, the Office of Archives and Records of the Archdiocese of New Orleans, and New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. Today, we're going to cover how to identify burial locations. So just as a recap, or, or for those of you who are new, all of the session materials, links, and videos are posted at the main program hub on the City Archives website, which is archives.nolalibrary.org, as you see right here. As you can see, when you get to our page, you just want to move down to New at the Archives and click on Identifying Your Catholic Ancestors link. That'll bring you directly to the program page where you will find a session-by-session -session breakdown of videos, handouts, and helpful links. So let's meet our presenters for the last time. There's Kimberly Johnson. She's the Senior Processing Archivist and Records Analyst for the Office of Archives and Records at the Archdiocese of New Orleans, where she helps manage conservation and preservation of historic and current records. She holds a Master's of Arts in History and is a certified archivist. Hello, Kimberly. Hi, guys. Heather Veneziano is the Director of Public Engagement and Development for New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, as well as an architectural historian and cultural heritage advisor with the preservation firm of Gambrel and Peak. She holds a Master's of Fine Art and a Master's in Preservation Studies. Hello, Heather. Hi. There's Katie Vest. She is the research archivist for the Office of Archives and Records at the Archdiocese of New Orleans. In addition, she researches and translates genealogy requests in French, Spanish, Italian, and German. She holds a Master's of Arts in History with an emphasis in public history and is a certified archivist. Hey, Katie. Everyone. And I am Amanda Fallis. I am a librarian and archivist at the New Orleans City Archives and Special Collections at New Orleans Public Library. I work there with genealogical and municipal government records. I hold a master's of library in information science and I too am a certified archivist. Let's move on. So I'm going to hand it over to Heather Veneziano for our wonderful like hands-on experience of cemetery research. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Um, as Amanda stated, my name is Heather Veneziano. I'm the director of public engagement and development for New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. I hope all of you have enjoyed the session so far. I'm so pleased to see so many of you joining us for this, the final session. Today I'll be discussing how to identify burial locations and we'll be tying in information covered within previous sections. This is a fun way to put the tools that you have learned about, to use the tools that you have learned about to put to good use and to show examples similar to those you may encounter through your own research. Throughout the presentation, I'll be showing various archival images and hopefully matching the burial record to the burial or interment locations. Okay, to begin with, I'd like to start off with the burial record of an enslaved man named Robert. He died on November 22nd, 1840 at around age 30 and was buried within St. Louis Cemetery number two with no location information given. This example gives us some information to go off of that might ultimately lead a researcher to glean a bit more about his life, but the details of his death, like so many enslaved people, remains perhaps forever a mystery. Scholars, for the most part, are only just recently studying death, funeral, and burial practices of the enslaved, or those practices pushed upon them by their enslavers. And within this somewhat new field of exploration, there's extremely little being done in regards to researching the deaths, funerals, and burials of those enslaved within urban settings. 
most studies focus on rural plantation-centered practices. If you know of anyone working on this, um, working on the death and burial customs of the enslaved within urban settings, please let me know. I would love to learn more about this topic. One site in the country that has explored the burial customs and practices of people of African descent within the colonial period in an urban setting is the African Burial Ground National Monument in Manhattan. I've included the website on this slide for anyone that is interested in learning more. I highly recommend visiting if you ever have the chance to. It is operated by the National Park Service and I feel that they do a really decent job with interpretation. Colonial New York is a world away from Colonial Louisiana, as we all know, but some information translates well to what can be expected in regards to the burials of enslaved people in New Orleans. The last paragraph shown on the this, on this screen shows the parallels. Individual burials, mostly in wooden coffins, However, as I stated earlier, this is an area of the research that really needs to be explored further. We know so very little, and we need to work harder to learn about the lives of these very important individuals. Okay, so what do we know about enslaved burials in New Orleans other than what I just mentioned? We know that some enslaved individuals were interred within tombs owned by their enslavers because there are, ar there are archival records mentioning that. We also know that almost every historic cemetery within the city of New Orleans holds unmarked in-ground burials. Some of these in-ground burials were set aside sections for that purpose. Some were marked initially with wooden or short, other short-lived markers, and that as the city expanded and became more populated, areas set aside for in-ground burials oftentimes were reclaimed as real estate for above-ground tombs. Okay, so what about Robert? Um, Robert was most likely buried within the ground in square three of the cemetery. This map produced circa 1835 and it was, was in the records of the city archives at the New Orleans Public Library. Unfortunately, only contained squares one and two of the cemetery. However, both of those squares are clearly marked in the center of each square with the words for the whites. This corresponds with what many of you already know, that historically squares one and two of St. Louis Cemetery number two were for white burials and interments, and square three was historically set aside for the burials and interments of the enslaved, black people, and people of color. That being the case, it is most likely that Robert's burial was in square three, and because it was done for free, his remains are most likely buried within, an un within the ground in an unmarked grave. Okay, moving forward, I kept going back and forth about whether or not to include this example, but ultimately chose to do so. This archival record is for the interment of Jules Ward on December 19, 1917 in St. Louis Cemetery number two. Mr. Ward was 71 years old at the time of his death and the location of his interment is listed as square two, square two, tomb 27, third alley. Before we get into the location, let's learn a bit more about him. Using Ancestry.com, I was able to pull up him and his family in the U.S. Census of 1900. He was listed on the census as a gardener residing at 1668 South White Street with his wife, Mary, and seven of their children. His death record, located on FamilySearch.org, lists his date of death as December 18, 1917, and New Orleans State's newspaper ran his death announcement on December 19th. 1917, the day, he the day he was interred within the cemetery. So the record says square two, tomb 27, third alley, but neither of the locations seem correct to me. This map was produced in the early 1990s and is currently um, in the possession of New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. It was created for our, our office. I cannot see any members of his family listed on the tombs tablets. Um, and so this will remain a mystery for another day. However, I wanted to add it in because to, it, a good example of that, even with all the tools that we have, sometimes we still get stuck. I'm determined to find it though, so stay tuned. And once I do, I'll be sure to post it on our Facebook page and through our newsletter at New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. As most of you know, this is almost never easy. 
Genealogy takes time, resources, and problem-solving skills. For this example, I lack the suitable time, but that will not stop me from pursuing it in the future. Okay, this is another entry that deals with transfers. And this is from a St. Louis number two cemetery burial book. This entry is for nine-year-old Frank Sizan, who was interred on October 18th, 1918 in square three. But it also lists two subsequent transfers of his remains and gives the dates and locations of each. Please note that the spelling of his surname in the record, because it is something that may cause a roadblock to researchers later on. This map and two detail shots show his original interment location within the Bank of Wall Vaults bordering Robert Robertson Street in October of 1918 and his second interment within the Bank of Wall Vaults bordering Claiborne Avenue in September of 1942. Both of these are within square number three. His second transfer and his third interment was it to a tomb within square one of the cemetery in January of 1973. And here you can see the surname um, clearly marked on the plot map. Using the New Orleans Cemetery database, which we covered um, last time, which will be published later this year, we are able to locate his final resting place as being the tomb of Mr. and Mrs. Charles D. Sizan and family. Please note that the spelling of the surname, it has an A that was missing from Frank's burial entry. By clicking on the Map It button um, within the database, we are able to see the location of the tomb within the greater cemetery marked by that red pinpoint. These photographs were taken earlier this week when I went out to document tombs for this presentation. As you can see from these photographs, two memorial markers are present, the closure tablet with the names of Mr. and Mrs. Charles de Cizanne and a military marker for Charles Raymond Sizan acknowledging his service in the Second World War. No other names of the interred are present on this marker. Nine-year-old Frank Sizan is now remembered only in the stories of his family and the archival records that bear his name. As we will further explore later in this presentation, children generally leave a very small paper trail, and that is why locating any record for them and acknowledging their short lives is so very important. Women are another group that are difficult to research. Really everyone with the exception of wealthy older white males will prove difficult in various ways. And even them, then even with those, sometimes you'll have some difficulties. So let's use this burial book entry for Mrs. C. Ploche as an example. What can we learn from it? Well, she was interred on December 30th, 1920 within a tomb on the priest's alley in square two of St. Louis two number St. Louis Cemetery number two. She was 62 years old at the time of her death. Okay, find a grave. Honestly, this is the first place I always go when researching a tomb or a person. It is fast, easy, and efficient. Well, sometimes. This time, it was one of those times. By typing in the surname Plache with 1920 as the year of death and listing New Orleans as location, I was able to get an exact hit. Our mystery woman was Carmelite Alice Gelfi Plache. Through this, we learn her birth date as well as the exact location of her tomb within the cemetery, information that was missing from the barrel entry. And as an extra bonus, we get to see an image of her that someone uploaded to the site. It is always so nice to be able to put a face to those that we are researching. Now that we have the exact location and her full name, we can easily find her tomb within the cemetery. This grand and elaborate tomb is one of the finest in the cemetery and is located on the priest's alley, which is a center alley within square two of the cemetery. Okay, let's jump across town now to St. Patrick's Cemetery and I'll talk a little bit more about the difficulties in researching children. In addition to having a very small paper trail, there are other factors that make researching their lives and deaths difficult. One of the main factors is that most of the time their parents were not expecting them to die so young. As parents, our wish is for our children to live long and happy lives and definitely to outlive us. People generally wait to prepare and pre-plan for their own funerals and burials until they reach middle-aged or beyond. 
And so when a death occurs suddenly, especially to a child, parents were and are often caught off guard. Let's take a look at this entry of Lizzie Doherty, a 15 month old victim of scarlet fever, whose burial or interment took place on September 17, 1889 within St. Patrick's Cemetery with no location given in the burial book. So who was little Lizzie Doherty? At only 15 months old, her life left little documentation. However, for her, we are lucky enough to locate an obituary, a rare occurrence for someone so young during this time period in which she died. The obituary lists her name, age, and the full names of both of her parents. Using that information, we are able to start building a tree in, on ancestry. We see that James and Elizabeth had other children and that did live into adulthood. We can also locate the birth and death dates for each of them. Now that we know who her parents were and their dates of death, we can use Find a Grave to see if they show up, which they do. Their plot is located within St. Patrick Cemetery number one. Could Lizzie also be buried there? Yes. Do we know for sure? Unfortunately, we do not. Lizzie's grave remains unmarked. We would like to hope that she is buried in a location later used by the rest of her family. However, it may be the case that since her death was so early, her parents may not have owned the plot at that time. They might not have had the money or they might not have had the foresight. That being said, regardless of whether or not she is buried within their same plot, she was buried within the same sacred ground of the cemetery and that brings a high level of solace. Moving over, a block to St. Patrick Cemetery number two, let's try working backwards from a tomb to the record. This is what I have to do most often as a cemetery historian and through my role with New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. The Quinlan family tomb is located within St. Patrick Cemetery number two. You can virtually locate it by going to the 360 virtual tour page on our website and clicking on St. Patrick Cemetery number two. If you maneuver through the cemetery, you will ultimately locate it within section two, close to the Canal Street entrance to the cemetery. So let's take a look at the tablet and figure out where to best start our search. I generally like to start with the first male name since I stated earlier, males tend to have a larger paper trail. From there, I generally work down the list of names until I get enough information to be able to start building out a family tree. The first male listed was Joseph Quinlan, who died on October 12, 1880, aged 14 years. Taking his name, date of death, and cemetery in which he was interred, I was able to put in a records request at the Office of Archives and Records of the Archdiocese of New Orleans. His burial entry shows us much of the information that we already gleaned from this tablet, but also a few other details that we would otherwise be unaware of, such as his cause of death and the location. I also put in a request for John and Eugenie Quinlan. They died within four months of each other, both from consumption. Please note that Eugenie's surname was spelled incorrectly within the book entry. So now we have the burial book entries for the three individuals and the names and dates of death for a bunch more of the same family from the tablet. Where do we go from here? This is when I really like to start digging in deep to ancestry.com and we start plugging in the information that I have to start building a framework from which to expand upon with additional records. Even with only a few basic facts, relationships can start coming to the surface and timelines are set in place. We quickly learn that John and Eugenie were husband and wife to a large family. Knowing that they died within four months of one another, it is hard to begin to understand what the children and the rest of the family went through shortly after their passing. Um, this is an image of the Swoop family tomb in St. Patrick Cemetery number two. As you can see, it looks a bit different from the marble faced masonry tombs that are commonly found throughout our cemeteries. This is one of 16 cast iron tombs located within the cemeteries of New Orleans. The majority of these tombs were constructed for families with ties, usually through ownership, of local foundries here in town. This tomb, as we will learn, is no exception to that rule. It is worth noting that these were constructed using multiple cast iron panels that were pieced together, much like cast iron fences are assembled. The reddish hue of this monument is due to the buildup of rust upon the surface, 
a treatment plan through restoration would address the rust and then see the tomb and surrounding fence painted. Cast into the pediment of the tomb is the name Sebastian Swoop. Let's see if we could find out anything about him from the burial books. So taking his one name and date of death over to the Office of Archives and Records, we can find and see what we can find. This entry is for Sebastian Stanleyus Swoop, dated February 20th, 1882, when the young man is only 18 years old. It does give the location of this tomb, but seeing that he was only 18 is most likely that he was the son of Sebastian Swoop listed on the pediment. The name is not a common one. So at this point, I would either put in another records request or see what I could find online using some of the resources presented in past sessions. Okay, great. Um, the information that we're looking for was easily found by typing the name into Newsbank using the New Orleans Public Library website accessible through my library card. I was able to locate the obituary for Sebastian Swoop listed on the pediment. Some key facts listed on the right of the screen. We see that he was the junior owner of the Shakespeare's foundry, which explains the material choice of his tomb. And we also learn a little bit about him and his family. How can we go further having this information? Before putting in an additional records request, I would start building out the Swoop tree on Ancestry using the information from the tomb's tablet and the information from Mr. Swoop's obituary. Through very minimal research, his tree came together. And I'm sure if I continue and follow up with additional record requests, I would come very close to getting a well-rounded and somewhat complete history of the vital records of this specific family. Okay, let's leave St. Patrick's Cemetery now and head over to St. Joseph Cemetery number one and number two. Given what we have already seen about the burial and interments of children, let's take a look at this entry within the burial book of 1893 to 1902. This specific record dates to November 4th, 1894, and is for John and Nellie Robertson, aged three and two years respectively. Both young children died as the result of burns and both were buried within a single grave with, quote, fence, end quote, listed as a location in the side margin. Fence, or at the fence, is a common location notation for St. Joseph Cemetery within the early books. St. Joseph 1 and 2 both occupy full city blocks and are currently surrounded by fences on all four sides of both squares. Historically, the only boundary to not have a fence is the one bordering Washington Avenue within St. Louis Cemetery number one, because that line originally contained wall faults. So what fence are we dealing with? Unfortunately, that is not something we will likely ever know. We can assume that it is the rear fence because we know that there was initially space left at the rear of the cemetery for in-ground burials. We can also assume that the grave once held a wooden marker and that has long since been lost. So now the location of their grave, much like Lizzie Doherty in St. Patrick and Robert in St. Louis too, is unfortunately unknown. Like I said earlier, children generally do not leave a long paper trail and it is generally, generally difficult to find out much about them through the use of archival sources. However, any victim of a crime or of a fire or any newsworthy event will normally have some articles dedicated to their lives or the circumstances of their death in the local newspaper. I know that the children died as the result of burns in 1894. So given that information, I went over to the New Orleans Public Library website and using my library card, I was able to do a search through Newsbank and through the historic local newspapers of that time period. I limited my search to 1894 and used fire and Robertson as my search terms. As I expected, a number of articles appeared detailing the fire. The first, on November 2nd, explained the details of the fire that occurred on November 1st on Owl Bayou Station on the Illinois Railroad Central Railroad line at the time, located about 40 miles from New Orleans. The children's father, David Robertson, was employed as an engineer at a local mill, and after working a 48-hour shift, he returned home and laid down for an afternoon nap with his children, while his wife and their infant were out making preparations to visit New Orleans for the baby's upcoming baptism. 
The Robertson home was located close to the railroad track, and it seems that sparks from the track somehow started the fire. Mr. Robertson woke up at 1.30 p.m. to find his home on fire and his children already dead. He exited the building with their bodies, but not before taking on substantial burns himself. Martin Smith, one of his friends, helped him to Ponchachula in order to seek medical care, but he was quickly transferred to Charity Hospital in New Orleans for treatment given the severity of his burns. While in New Orleans, arrangements were made for the burial of his two children. It's really hard to fathom this, but the intense tragedy that befell this family and how when caring for her infant and being concerned about her husband in the hospital, how much grief Mrs. Robertson was dealing with when she had to bury her two oldest children alone on November 4th. Five days later, her husband passed away due to effects of his injuries. The newspaper on November 11th said that he received a, quote, hero's burial, end quote. The article stated that at five o'clock, this is a quote, five o'clock the pathetic funeral ceremonies were conducted before a large gathering of symp sympathetic friends at PJ McCone's parlors, after which the procession moved to St. Joseph's Cemetery. The, decent, the deceased was a sober and industrious man, a faithful and loving husband and father, and with many friends, one by his genial disposition, have expressed their deep sympathy for the hero's babe and widow. Knowing the date of death for David Robertson, along with the cemetery, allows us to also look up his burial entry. In it, we see that he was 42 years old and that he too was buried at the fence, hopefully close to the graves of his children. This example, though heart-wrenching, is a good one because it not only shows the difficulty in researching individuals, it also provides a glimpse into their humanity and helps us to contextualize why we do what we do as researchers how we try to honor the past and document the lives lost well before their time. For this record, um, this little boy was only nine months old. Um, his name was John Lally and he was interred on May 7th, 1893 within St. Joseph Cemetery number two. This is a good record because it gives some good information about his passing, but also a very clear um, record of his location. So, um, using Ancestry to find the birth record, we're able to find what his middle name was, what his birth date was, and the name, full names of both of his parents. And then with the location information from the burial entry, we're able to look at a map of St. Joseph Cemetery number two and locate the exact location. And I've circled it with this little red mark so that all of you can tell as well. Okay, so going out to the cemetery, we're able to easily find the plot, the Lally coping. So on the marker, um, John Lally's name is missing. He was only nine months old. He died in 1893, as I stated. And with such a short life, a lot of times, even though the infants are interred within the plot, their names just aren't recorded on the marker. So really the archival records that exist for his birth record and his death record and death entry within the burial book are really the only archival information that marks his life. So this is the last one I'm going to go through. Um, this is uh, for Elizabeth Muller. This is from St. Joseph Cemetery number one. With her, it's difficult. With all women, it's a little bit difficult. So we have to determine, was Muller her maiden name? Was it her married name? Um, was she a widow? Where was she at at the time of her death in regards to her name? The location is listed as jo Joseph Kaiser's lot section A. So that doesn't give us a whole lot of information about the exact location of her interment. So we'd have to do a little bit more searching to be able to figure things out. So the first place I went to look for more information about her, especially to substantiate what her name actually was at the time of her death, was using the obituary index on the website of the New Orleans Public Library. So there, three different entries show up. I was able to pull up the first one. And from this entry, from the Daily Picune on um, June 10th, 1900, we're able to see that she passed away on June 9th at 9.50. Um, she was the beloved wife of 
John Mahler, age, and she was age, age 69 years, six months, and five days. She was born in Germany and was a resident of New Orleans for 49 years. We're also able to see some organizations that she belonged to throughout the city um, and where her funeral was going to take place. So taking that information, um, I went over to find a grave and then I tried to find out, well, we'll find a grave like our previous entry, give us some more location information. Unfortunately, it does not, but it does show some information that we didn't have before. It shows some other individuals interred within the same tomb as her. So you'll see her name listed on the top of the marker and then that of her husband directly below her and other individuals of the same family. So this, is, this was tough because I had some information. I knew what section she was in, um, but I didn't have the exact location. So that really just takes a bit of legwork. So I went out to the cemetery um, and by walking around in that general area, I was able to come across the Muller tomb. This tomb, you can see it has a newer tablet for the um, enclosure tablet. So I looked around the side and the back to make sure that the original tablet was not present because as I stated in earlier sessions, sometimes those original tablets have additional information that's not included on the replacement tablet. So we could probably guess that the original tablet probably broke um, and was not easily repairable. And it was probably in so many pieces that they chose not to affix it to the side or the back, or they just wanted a cleaner look. So the newer tablet lists um, Elizabeth's burial on the top and then the rest of her family just says in find a grave. But this is just to show that like even without an exact location, if you kind of know where it is or if you even know the cemetery with enough time and walking around, you will generally be able to find it if the records exist. So with that, I just wanted to really thank everyone for joining us through all these sessions. I learned a lot through your communication with me through email after the sessions and also from the question and answer period. I hope that we can continue to have various workshops in the future and that you all will participate. Um, I'm going to be sending a survey along in a week or two for you all that want to complete it to help us understand like what we could do better and what you'd want to see more of in the future. So I hope to get a lot of responses from that. Um, I just wanted to say thank you and we're gonna open it up for questions and bring everybody up back in. Excellent, thank you so much for that presentation, Heather. It was uh, very educational to see some of these processes from start to, to either conclusion or as far as they could go. I think mm -hmm. it was very neat to do a hands-on like this. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, everybody, Thank you guys for being here to uh, watch all this. We are going to, as Heather said, open it up for questions in a moment. Let's just do a couple of guidelines, just, just as per usual. The guidelines are only submit questions via chat. Once I open it up, please keep it clear of conversations or crosstalk. Please submit only one question per participant unless um, a, a sufficient amount of people have also asked theirs. We will get to as many questions as we can by 12.15 and luckily we have plenty of time right now. Mm -hmm. um, please make sure your questions pertain to the information presented today. But since this is the last session, if, if you can ask any questions that you have from the general series, we're happy to answer them. As I said, we'll get to as many questions as possible by 12.15 and please always feel free to contact any of us if we don't get to your question today. I have appreciated everybody that has reached out to me. It's helpful to know what people need and also um, just to help you all out if you're looking for something. Let me put up our contact information on this next slide and then I will let you all know when it is officially open for chat. And chat is now open. Please submit your questions. Oops. And I will make sure to ask them of our presenter today. Let's see here, where's my chat window? Good, good, good. Okay. <laughs> I was like, did I, did I get working? Okay. First question. Can I get on the mailing list for future webinars? 
So generally, um, there is a mailing list that you can sign up for at nolalibrary.org right on the front page. Let me see if I can navigate that to that really quick for you all. That um, will allow you to sign up specifically for Louisiana Division slash City Archives events, which is us. Um, let me show you how to get to that. You go to nolalibrary.org. And as you can see right here, let me see if I can zoom in at all. Maybe not. But um, right here, get library news and program updates, newsletter sign up. Um, I'll go ahead and sign myself up for it so we can demonstrate. So I'm going to sign up for it. It's going to be an email subscription. Oops, not going to cancel. Submit. And so as you see here, there's an, a place to uh, choose library topics. You can do all library locations, you can do specific things. Um, I would say generally you want to keep an eye on the main library. You can do all library locations if you want. And then there you go. There are some subscriber preferences here. You can update if you want to. You can submit questions and you can adjust uh, subscriptions to other city agencies. So there you go. And then for us, if you go to nolacatholiccemeteries.org on the bottom of the screen, there'll be a, a sign up for our newsletter. So you'll be able to know of upcoming events for us as well. Am I getting that right, .org? Here we go. Yep. So let's see here. Here's the monthly e-newsletter sign up yep, right, right here. There. I'll sign up for that too, so y'all can see it in action. And then we'll get back to questions. <laughs> and I'm signed up. Okay, let's get back to the next question. So that's how you can sign up for Boys to Follow Us. We are, of course, um, the City Archives and NOLA Catholic Cemeteries are both on Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, the City Archives, if you go to archives.nolalibrary.org, you can click and find out about our Facebook page. And then NOLA Catholic Cemeteries, they also have their Facebook information on the page here too, I believe. Yep, yep on there we go. Facebook and Instagram. So next, can you tell us again where to find the records request forms? Well, they're available on our main uh, program website for uh, this, this whole series, which as we said in the beginning was archives.nolalibrary.org and identifying your Catholic ancestors. In um, the session two materials, there's the genealogy request form, but its proper home is at the, um, uh, at the Archdiocese of New Orleans archives. It's, so I think, archives.arch-no.org. As you see me typing here is, is my favorite way to get to it, but here it is. And so you can go to genealogy, request a certificate, but genealogy I believe is where we wanna click. Mm -hmm. And there's your genealogy request form right here in the middle, click here. So I hope that answers. There's several places to get the forms and on the forms you have the information for how to send it in at the bottom there. Okay, how to check for an obituary. I'm having trouble finding them on Ancestry. Well, if it's New Orleans, we generally uh, suggest you start with the City Archives Obituary Index, which again is at archives.nolalibrary.org. With and, session uh, three, you did a pretty thorough run through. Of yeah, that. yeah. So that you want to refer to that. Yeah, so if you go back to our program page here, and go to session three. I have a really thorough, if you click on the session three video recording here, this, <laughs> we're gonna play a session within a session. There is an interesting let me thing stop all of these papers. But here it is, here it is. Just click on session three video recording and that is a very in-depth um, demonstration of how to do the obituary index. But um, again, if you just come to our website, scroll down to genealogy, um, Louisiana Biography Obituary Index is one of them and there are others, but I highly recommend watching this session. Mm -hmm. Where can we find maps of the cemeteries? They're in various places. <laughs> yeah, so the easiest way right now is if you have family within one of our cemeteries, you can make an appointment to visit one of our offices and they will be able to show you the paper maps. We're in the process of getting um, 
drone photography done and we're going to do map overlays on that drone photography and hopefully have that published to our website in the next few months. Um, it's a slow process, but we're trying to get everything digitized so that people can have online access to the maps that we use every day. But there are other maps um, available through various sources online. Once the cemetery database goes live, that will have good maps of St. Louis one and two present on there. Um, so it really depends on the cemetery, which cemetery exactly that you're looking for. But the easiest way for our cemeteries is to make an appointment to visit one of our offices and see they're kind of wall sized paper maps. So they're very, very large, but our staff will be able to walk you through the process. And here's their contact information right here under New mm -hmm. Orleans Catholic Cemeteries on the screen. Is there a way to get a list of all persons buried in a particular grave where the grave only has a family name? No, and that's something we keep talking about at all the sessions because I wish that you could. Um, but the way that the interment and burial books are structured, it's by cemetery, it's in a cemetery, um, date of burial or interment and the name of the individual. We do not have records for everyone within a tomb. It's just historically the way the books were organized. So if you have names of names and date of death of individuals within your family, you can put in records request searches for them and see if, um, if it does give a location of their burial of, or interment, but we cannot do a search for everyone within a particular grave or tomb. Okay. Um, next question. I am trying to locate the specific location of a burial in St. Mary's Cemetery, Carrollton. The burial occurred in the mid 1950s. The grave is unmarked. I know for sure my grandfather is buried there. I would like to add a headstone. So that's a city owned yeah, cemetery. A um, there are some so, record for the mid 1950s. Um, I think it's mostly the city will have the records. Right. I don't think you all have them. Um, so let's so go older ones we do. to the cemeteries um, page, which I believe is under the Department of Property Management. Mm -hmm. So here. <laughs> So this is NOLA.gov. What I, what I searched, as you all saw me on the screen in Google, was NOLA.gov space cemeteries. And it, I clicked on property management because I know that inherently. I'm going to tell you all now, today, property management is where cemeteries is. So click on property management. So there's facilities maintenance, but I believe you want to scroll down to cemeteries. So for the most up-to-date information, they have a dedicated page. Oh, which is, is conveniently, the URL is nola.gov slash cemeteries. And this is who you wanna contact about your St. Mary's Cemetery slash Carrollton uh, grave and, and doing so. So you wanna contact, it looks like Emily Ford, cemetery superintendent or the services specialist, but I would contact both of these people over here to the, um, to the right. So again, to reiterate, nola.gov slash cemeteries for city cemeteries. And here's some contact information. I will say all of this information and this development is very new. Uh, Emily Ford is the new cemetery superintendent and I believe she has plans to make these more accessible and more informative for everybody. We've talked to her as a city archives and I, I'm looking forward to further developments finally from municipal cemeteries because I know for a very long time it was a little bit inscrutable and a little bit 50-50 um, whether you would ever be able to get in contact with anybody or do anything. <laughs> Is it possible to get a tips summary for successful searches from each presenter on each of the sites and links? I am having great difficulty searching for information even when I know the names and details. Um, well, gosh, a, a, a guide to a guide to cemetery research I, that that's that's essentially how we would couch our tips. Um, if it's tips about spelling and database searching, I do cover that a lot in um, our first session, actually. Um, session one um, during, uh, during my section, um, I definitely, well, and I think we all, we all address, we all address the issue with name changes, et cetera. But um, in session one, that's the one that I would recommend. 
you know, um, advanced tips and tricks, databases and other resources, avoid doing a general search on the homepage, avoid filling out every box on a database search screen, learn the records collections. This is essentially my, my tips and tricks for searching. Um, the thing to do is not all searches will be successful, unfortunately, but if you are having trouble with all of your searches, come to this session one slides. Uh, looks like we're about, and you get to the advanced tips and tricks. This is really it right here. You know, this is what you need to do and think about when you're searching. Like we're talking about, you know, names always aren't correct in records, be flexible. Here are some really advanced database um, replacement check techniques. Like if you um, are looking like, you know, John, Johns, Johnson, you can use the star to just replace up to five characters afterwards or to replace one vowel. Um, these are these are really, this is the tips and tricks for successful searching right here in our session one. Um, do you guys have anything to add, I suppose? No, I think just referring to those. And then if you're ever stuck with a question that you think one of us will be better able to answer. You could email us directly and we'll try to help you through it. Right, right. Like if you're if you're on the Catholic cemeteries search and you have an issue, you know, send them an email. If you're having this issue with the obituary index, you know, send us at the city archives an email. Um, but generally, uh, I, I tried to list my my main um, tips and tricks for uh, research and record keeping in our session one. Okay, next question. My great grandmother was interred in St. Patrick's Cemetery. The record shows cemetery number three in square 28. I was told the squares were renumbered and I found no stones in the square. Any, any ideas on how to find it? I would reach out to our St. Patrick office directly. And if Amanda, you wanna to go to our website really fast. Yes. And I wanna go then to cemeteries. our cemeteries and then Catholic cemeteries. And then you scroll down so you can go to St. Patrick um, 3. St. Patrick 3. Mm -hmm. And then this is the inf information about who you should get in contact with. So Claudia uh, Desla is fantastic and she's really a wonderful person to be really totally, um, up for trying to help you with locating that, that internment. So you contact her during normal business hours, Monday to Friday, 8 to 4.15. Her phone number and email address are on the screen right now. I'm going to leave this up for a second so you can copy it down, but this is for St. Patrick's number three. Um, really for all the St. Patrick's cemeteries, um, this is who you should contact. Oh, we have a wonderful uh, comment next. The Cizan tomb is of my grandparents. Oh, it was wonderful to see great. it in the presentation. I am not sure who baby Frank Cizan is. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Great. If Jennifer, if you want to uh, email me, I'll send you all the, the, ancestry tree that I've built out so far. I haven't been able to find the connection yet either, but um, I would love to work on that because it's a mystery to me as well. And I'd love to, to solve it, but it's so nice to see somebody who has a direct tie to one of the two. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, here you go. New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, that's Heather's contact information. Next question. In the 1970s, my great uncle's in-ground burial site was covered by the cavalry mausoleum in St. Patrick number one. Why were records not kept of those whose remains were interred there? It appears that all records of his burial and other interred there were erased from any records? They wouldn't have been erased. Um, I would put in his burial, I would assume was fairly early on. If you do a records request, um, we want to go back to originally in the site of the Calvary mausoleum was a statue, some statuary of Calvary that got moved to St. Vincent de Paul cemetery number one. So that area didn't really have any burials um, located on it. So we replaced the statuary with the mausoleum, but please reach out to um, put in a records request and we do not erase records, so um, we'll, we should be able to locate that information. So we want to, she wants to contact, um, whoops, Hi. where were we? Contact Catholic cemeteries here. I, I would assume his, his, I don't know what date on what he died. But, died. Mm -hmm. 
So maybe she can reference the whom to call for cemeteries records. And depending on what year it is, that would let her know who she needs to contact about checking the original books. Mm -hmm. That's so what I would that, do. That document is under our program page, identifying your session, um, session materials, whom to call about cemetery records. I'll mm -hmm. open it up for you to look at right now. Whom to call for cemeteries records is the last document here. So St. Patrick number um, one. Yeah, yeah if you could see it. Current. Mm -hmm. So depending on when he died, you can either call us or you can call the Office of Archives and Records. So this is this is the cemetery. In I mean, call us or put in a records request form. I'm sorry, with the Arch Office of Archives and Records. Right. If it's before 1958. But it's it's 1970, so I guess we'll. Agree. Well, she's saying 1970 is when That's that. When it happened. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so we need to know the great uncle. So depending on the great uncle's death date. All right. Okay. I am from Lafayette, Louisiana, and most of my family is buried in St. John's Cemetery. Do you know if Lafayette Parish Library has some of the same resources as New Orleans? That's a good question. Um, at the city archives, uh, you know, in the in the last quarter of this year, we're we're going to embark on a project where we reach out to um, libraries across the state to find out what they do have in terms of genealogy resources, if they do, and any recommendations they not have. This is an ongoing project that will take us a little while to complete, but we'd like to survey everybody so we can get a map of sort of the situation in all of Louisiana. But in the meantime, let's check out Lafayette Public Library and see if we can figure anything out just by pounding the pavement or the internet, so to speak. Here we go, Lafayette Public Library. I would say, hmm, take a look at services. Maybe adult, let's see if they have any links right on their homepage. Lots going on at the Lafayette Public Library. Let's see here. I'm gonna say, let's try contact the library and see if they have a specific sort of, they have anything that says genealogy. I know in Calcasieu Parish, they have a genealogy center at a specific place. I would say at this juncture, you should contact, um, you should contact, ask a librarian directly, um, or, or rather uh, their reference. Oh, look, 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 it says reference slash information request slash genealogy. We found it. Okay, here you go. This is who you want to email in Lafayette for further information. Let me see if I can get that bigger. There's nothing like sleuthing on the internet. Us librarians certainly love it. <laughs> um, so here we go. Reference slash information slash request slash genealogy for Lafayette Public Library. There's the phone numbers and there is the email reference at lafayettepubliclibrary.org. So um, this is who you wanna ask. Um, they may have uh, some of the same databases. Um, it seems likely, uh, I'm gonna give this about 30 more seconds for you to write down, but also you can do the same thing I did, which is go to lafayettepubliclibrary.org and, and click on contact us under, but I wanna see if maybe services where they might have their digital services listed. I think references and resources. Maybe yeah, too. Let's try that. They have Newsbank. Now, when I click on this, I don't have a Lafayette Public Library card, but if you do, type it in here and let's see what they have. And I would say, see what they have um, in terms of like having Newsbank, uh, Ancestry, uh, Heritage Quest, those kind of resources that we have at New Orleans Public Library. So I hope that gets you there. I hope that gets you there. Let's go on to the next question. Let me get the contact information back up. It might be possible ancestor wasn't Catholic, how to find a marriage. I can't find it. Um, so marriages, it depends. It depends on the time period. It depends on the location. Orleans Parish marriage records um, 
we have an index on our website, archives.nolalibrary.org for um, I believe 1866, I mean 1846 to 1880. We have a few more, um, whoops, what am I doing? Not the right thing. Here we go. Um, so if you scroll down to our genealogy section, we have an index to the justice of the peace marriage records. You can search by the groom's last name or the bride's maiden name. Uh, you can order them from us if you find an entry. This is a place to start if it occurred between 1846 to 1880. Um, up to 1916, you could ask us to do a search because we do have an additional um, records of the Board of Health that go beyond 1880. And then even beyond 1880, um, Orleans Parish records older than 50, um, marriage records older than 50 years old go to the Secretary of State. So that's SOS for Secretary of State. Dot la dot gov. When you're here, historical resources is where you want to go, then research historical records. And it, after all this spiel in the picture, you see the link to the online public vital records index, your best friend. I don't know why they bury it like that, but here it is. This is important. So you can check Louisiana death, death records within the record time periods, birth within time periods. Of course, this is all subject to records, state records, privacy laws. Um, you know, it has to be births more than 100 years ago. It has to be deaths more than 50 years ago. And then Orleans Parish marriage records more than 50 years ago. So um, you can search Orleans Parish marriage record index and it covers, I believe, um, it covers all the ones that you saw on our website. And uh, um, let's see here. Uh, goes up to 69 right now, which is, is about right. Yeah, that's 50 years from 2019. So um, this is where you wanna search. As, as we've recommended in every, every presentation, try different spellings or go slow. Like if you're looking, if I'm looking for Fallis, my last name, I'm gonna start with F, I'm gonna start with A, I'm gonna start with L. And we'll start here. We have a lot, let me add in another L. We've got some falls, let me add in an I. There's only, there's only a phallus and a phallon. Um, if neither of me or this people, I might back up, or I mean, I'm sorry, if neither of these people is mine, I might back up a letter and just start investigating F-A-L-L to see if maybe there was a misspelling or something like falls is common. A-S is common, although as we can see, we don't have results, but um, this is what you want to do. Adjust your spelling if you're not finding anything. Now, of course, um, sometimes the marriage record doesn't exist. I'm not, it, it happens. It happens depending on the time period. It just depends. Okay, let's see here. Next. Is it possible to post somewhere the different cemetery maps where the alleys are legible? That is something I'm working on trying to get done. Um, we have a, such a long list of things to get done, but it's yeah. definitely something that is a priority for me. So I'm really going to try to do that. Um, hopefully within the year, I can't make any promises just because of the amount of work that we have, but because this is only one aspect of what I do. Um, but I, even for myself, having the maps available online where all the information is legible would be such a huge help. So it's definitely something I'm working on and hope I will definitely, once that is available and open enough for everybody to see, I'll be sure to share that news um, widely through our social media and newsletter to let everybody know. Awesome, great, great. Um, the next question was Catholic records request form, but I think it may have been asked um, before we addressed it uh, earlier with the other question that was the same. But again, that's, um, that's archives.arch-no.org. Yeah, I think she was clarifying for the first oh, one. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't Perfect. know what I typed in there, but I clearly typed the wrong thing. I apologize. Oh, you forgot to ask. That's all good. Okay. Um, Let's see, next, oh, my scrolling went backwards. Um, an ancestor is listed in two cemeteries on find a grave. Since the family did a new stone and ceremony in 2004 at one cemetery, that is probably the correct one, but he is listed in a Confederate memorial in Metairie Cemetery. Should I have something added to the find a grave Metairie Cemetery entry showing where he is really buried? 
he is in one of the St. Patrick cemeteries. I would say that's up to you, but um, yeah, there's no reason not to um, add more information to find a grave entries. I mean, it, gosh, I am, I am not typing good today, guys, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a pretty easy process to update um, as long as you have a find a grave account and those are free. So I yeah, would sign so up for that. You know, register and um, add the information to the other entry. Yeah. It's really useful, you know, for all the people that might be researching him or just people in the future wanting to know yeah. the location. I know a lot of our tombs on find a grave, sometimes the pe person was transferred, like we showed before, like people do get transferred pretty often somewhat in New Orleans. So on find a grave, it might have information um, of their last, the last place they were before their current location. So it's always good to go in and update those records just for, to be helpful to other researchers out there. Yeah, I highly recommend, like, if you have additional information, yes, please, please add it to find a grave, because I know that it's just been, it's been so useful for me, too. I mean, it just, it, as Heather said, first place to start, <laughs> for sure. Um, our next comment is, thanks to both of you for all the time and effort you put into this presentation and the website. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you very you. much. And thank you. Um, thank you for saying that. <laughs> Um, at this time, about how long does a certificate request take to be processed? I believe this is a record if the archives, um, the Office of Archives and Records question, maybe. Yeah, so right now we currently do not have a timeline for completion of genealogy requests because we do have so many that come into our office and it's been a little bit of a crazy time. Um, so we go about, we say about two to three months is our like max. Um, we are going to be closed for two weeks in December and around Christmas time. So it's just something I know it's a few months away, but we just want to put out there right now. But we do do them as quickly as we can and try to get them out and back to you as quickly as we can. Excellent. Yes. Um, I have a great grandfather who died in NOLA during the early 20th century. I found his death date through a newspaper notice, the cemetery office where he was buried and family info. However, his death certificate is not recorded at the Secretary of State's archives in Baton Rouge. I've checked through their research, through researchers and personally. Any idea why it wouldn't have been recorded? No, but it's totally, it's totally within the realm of possibility. Um, early 20th century, you know, records weren't even required by the state until 1918. So that's a huge thing. Um, and even when the uh, requirement was implemented in 19, you know, Louisiana is a very rural state, especially at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, even though uh, records laws came into place, the administration and implementation was, was spotty and gradual. So it's very possible that in the early 20th century, he just didn't have one. Um, that was registered with the Secretary of State. That's highly possible. Now, I know you say New Orleans, it's still possible. Um, as with all record keeping, it sometimes unfortunately just happens. But it does sound that you did get a bunch of great stuff in the newspaper notice and the cemetery office and the family information. So you do have that for sure. It just seems to be an unfortunate oversight. And it does happen in genealogy from time to time. Great presentation. Thank you for offering this to us. Thank you guys for being here. This has been a wonderful six weeks. It's been wonderful interacting with you all. Please continue to. Um, I think the city archives, um, Catholic cemeteries and archdiocese, you know, we're gonna work on future digital programming. And as, as, as said, sign up for our, info, for our newsletters and to keep abreast of our future developments. I know we're working on some programs to put up in the coming months um, at the city archives for sure. More genealogy, more land yap, uh, you know, a lot of different stuff. So keep an eye on our Facebook page, which is again, facebook.com slash LouDiv. Let's go there real quick. And that's for our uh, traditional ancestral name, Louisiana division. That's what LouDiv is. Here we are. Still looks like this today. <laughs> That's Amanda <laughs> oh sitting there. <laughs> There's computers over here. <laughs> we do have some computers right over here with it where this desk is. 
<laughs> but um, yes, so as you can see, we've been posting for all the sessions. Um, oh, you want to join Facebook? Not right now, guys. But um, yeah, the last session live this Saturday, just um, we, we, we will keep you abreast of any upcoming Zoom sessions, etc. So please, please um, follow us on Facebook. Even if you don't have Facebook, as you can see here, you can go straight to the page and look at it. Many thanks to y'all for this valuable information. I enjoyed all six sessions. Carol Lima, thank you, Carol. Um, next, was there a German Catholic church in the 1860s in the area around Claiborne and Elysian Fields, Annunciation? Um, um, there was, wasn't there? There was, I don't believe it was Annunciation. Um, that's just something, if you could send us an email with that and we could get more of a definite look of that area at the time and to know which church it could possibly be, because I do know Annunciation sits lower and so that the crossroads you mentioned would be outside of the boundaries of theirs. But Is maybe Annunciation the name of the church? Or Annunciation would be the name of the church, yeah. That's what I was assuming in mm -hmm. this, because it's within that cross, like it's close to it, but it's definitely above the boundaries that it would hit normally. So, um, yeah, yeah if you said the edge of my brain that I saw something about this once. <laughs> yeah, it, there's, there's a lot of churches in, that pop up in that area too. Mm -hmm. So, because there's, they're all merged together now, but there is a lot of them. So if you send us an email, we'd be more than happy to help you and try to locate um, the church you're looking for. So there you go. That's the Archdiocese of New Orleans Office of Archives and Records information right there. Um, thank everyone who contributed to put these webinars together. Very good information. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. I can't, I can't continue to express how wonderful it is that everybody has been returning week after week, that we've had new people come in, and that so many of you have returned for all of these. We're grateful to see all of you all. We're grateful to see some of the people that we haven't been able to see in person for a while. I'm grateful to see your names. And I'm grateful to see all the new names and get all the new questions. I can't, I can't reiterate that enough. Um, you patrons are our lifeblood. <laughs> um, thank you all for an outstanding webinar series. Um, She's going to print out everything that is and keep it in a binder for easy reference. That's perfect. That's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. We love it. Thank you, Lisa. Um, thank you very much. Um, let's move on to another question since we still have a little more time. Um, oh, regarding my uncle's barrier in St. Patrick's number one, Emily Ford did help me with this. There are no records. Sherry Pepo did allow me to have a plaque paste place there. Okay. Okay. Um, my great great grandfather and grandmother died of yellow fever in 1855. I would like to find a grave, but think they may be in a mass grave since they were only in New Orleans one year after arriving from Germany. I would like to find their burial site if at all possible. You covered that prior to the session, but I actually could not decipher where to start. So, well, it's hard. Were they, if you know if they were Catholic, it would help narrow down the choices, but really it's going to be. If almost you, like, impossible yeah. i mean it, even if, if you maybe have any sort of location where they lived is or like the when they came up like on the ship and if you know like when they close to a month and a date when they a year when they died yeah. um that would be just any information you have you can always email one of us and we'll be happy to help you try to narrow it down a little bit more yeah, by 1855, there were a number of cemeteries. Um, that's just, it makes it a little bit harder, but we'll, we're all happy to help try to narrow it down if you get in touch with us with more information. Um, yeah, uh, so like, and, and, and additionally, like, there's no like comprehensive, comprehensive like locator for, for yellow fever mass variants. If only. That would be nice. <laughs> Let's see. A new project. <laughs> I have a date of birth, but nothing else. Should I send a record request for death or burial for more information? Uh, we would prefer you not to just, we would need more information to do it. Um, if you have like the census, census records from around like in between, like if you have the 1860 census and they're in that one and they're, but they're not in the 1870, even that information could be helpful if you know like uh, where they were living at the time if they any city records anything possible because without a date of death or close to a year we wouldn't be able to locate anything helpful for you 
I, just I think would... it's a good way to look up the genealogical guide that's on the mm -hmm. city archives website and oh, just to find to more information. Genealogical materials, my favorite. I love this. It's a fantastic resource. It, yes, yeah. that was that was authored by our previous um, city archivist, uh, Irene Wainwright and Wayne Everard, who are wonderful. They they got all our finding aids and stuff digitized by themselves, just by themselves. This entire website, um, indexing our millions of records, <laughs> and they did it all over the course of several years. But they also, in that time, authored the guide to genealogical materials, where they looked at all our city records and organized them into. Um, a wonderful sort of like guide to how you could apply these city records to genealogy. So they're organized by category here, as you see. It's my favorite. Y'all definitely check it out. It's become my favorite. <laughs> I think it's everyone's favorite. <laughs> it's, a, it's the quickest way to find things for sure. And it's the quickest way to put our thousands, hundreds of thousands of collections in, in um, a genealogical frame or to to look at them from a genealogical perspective because i know just like trying to figure out how to apply any of the city archives you know entry points to your genealogy could be confusing because this is really a historical presentation in the city archives organization um my great grandmother buried in saint patrick number three died in 1883 then to find her grave i should start with the archives yeah i would first put in a records request form um I think, yeah, 1883, that would be the yeah, Office of so. Archives and Records. And then with that information, um, after you have that, then I would contact the St. Patrick number three office, which we showed earlier in the Q&A period. And they'll be able to help you um, determine if it doesn't have a location, it'll be a little bit harder. But um, if it does or if it doesn't have a location in the internment book, I would then take that information and, and contact our St. Patrick office and they'll try to work with you to locate the location. Hopefully you'll be able to find it. Okay. Let's see, uh, thank you for the information in Lafayette. Oh, and somebody said go to services then adult learning, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys. Um, thank you everybody for all the thanks, we love it. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, let's see if there's any, I'm gonna see if there's any, oh, and, and thank you for our wonderful visitor from France. Thank you very much. Um, I think we had one more question. Let's see where, where we got it. At the end. Ah, yes. Live out of state, is it possible to get a library card to access info? Yes, yes it is. I will show you in a second. And, um, and it, oh, this is back to the, um, could they have been buried in benevolent society? Yellow, could yellow fever answer? Sisters have been buried in benevolent society tombs? If they were a member of that society, yeah. um, if this is the same, per I have to go back and look, but if you said they were only in New Orleans for a year, um, they might oh. not have joined um, in that short of a time period, but it is possible, you know, like if, if somebody died of yellow fever and they had a tomb, like either society tomb or a family tomb, then first they would be interred within that um, as opposed to just the mass burial of yellow fever victims. So if a tomb was present at the time for them, um, they yeah, might be right. in that one, but. You would have to have an idea of the benevolent society, of course, mm -hmm. who, which, which one. Mm -hmm. But if it's, if it is, the, if they immigrated from Germany, you could look at one's benevolent societies that are popular with the German population of the city at any given time. So it is a, Thing worth looking into. Um, there's just no way to know for sure. Right. But our records for that cemetery, though, aren't by benevolent society. They're just mm -hmm. in chronological order. So what really matters is the date of death. And then mm -hmm. if it's in that tomb, then generally, if it's a society tomb, it will mention that. But what's really important is the date of death. Yeah. For us. Mm -hmm. And it will mention that they're buried in the society tomb. It's even if they it, you feel like it's separate, it still will mention that. Right. The, the follow up question is, did yellow fever victims have to be buried outside cemeteries in special places? And it just it depended on the severity of that specific pan pandemic of yellow fever, because I mean, yeah, sometimes there were mass graves. Sometimes it was a mad rush. Sometimes it For wasn't the as bad. Catholic cemeteries, there were sections um, mm -hmm. for the yellow fever because they still would be buried in sacred ground within the cemetery. Um, 
So it wasn't outside of the cemetery, but. Yeah. Oh, my favorite. One year <laughs> in a day. I know. <laughs> I'm gonna just jump in and talk about this. So uh, <laughs> she just asked, wasn't there a rule on opening tombs during this period one year in a day? So the whole one year in a day, um, which we've all heard, everyone among us probably has heard, I have never been able to find primary source documentation listing that on any legal code of the city of New Orleans. So I think it's mainly based on Judeo-Christian um, burial belief system that it's like a year and a day of mourning, um, a year and a day to respect the dead. So, but legally, I cannot find, and no one that I know can find a city ordinance that states it has to be a year and a day. If any of you do have that information, please, please tell me because I've been searching for it because it's one of those things that's like, if you say it enough times it becomes true and like but maybe it is true so i would love to know if anybody else has found historical primary source documentation of that being a law on the books within the city but to my knowledge that's more of just a of a practice um people have talked about but not a legally required mm -hmm. one so it's really it has to do also with like in New Orleans, because we were Southern Louisiana, we reused tombs um, without embalming generally, not, it's not a hard and fast rule, but like a year and a day, the body would be sufficiently um, decomposed enough to be able to take a new interment within the tomb and um, move the bones to the other section. So it, I think a lot of it stems from that as well. But to my knowledge, like I said, there's not a law on the books stating that that is the case. That's a fun one though. Mm -hmm. It is a fun one. <laughs> is there a list of interments in New Orleans, 1853 resulting from the yellow fever epidemic? I think there is. So there's a list of the number of people mm -hmm. who passed away. Um, and I, it's actually on the public library's website, but I do not believe that there is a list of the individual's names. Yeah, this is this is what I'm thinking of. Um, yeah, because I know that there is a, a list of like how many numbers for each year that the epidemic hit the city. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if we have a direct link here. Beverly, do you know where you got that the list? Of everyone it's on here somewhere I, I know what she's okay. talking about <laughs> let's see I'll just type in yellow fever I just can't remember which section we have it in is is my thing this is what I'm thinking about that Beverly is mentioning mm -hmm. she says there is a list uh, I have a copy and uh, she's going to oh. send it to me so that's oh, okay. great. Okay. Is, is it maybe from that uh, really has been very helpful <laughs> to me. I just want to, like this has been such a wonderful series just because of all the knowledge I've gleaned from all of the <laughs> participants. Uh, Why 67 S page long? So that's yeah. great. Mm -hmm. Um that's awesome. Okay. It, it, there might have I think there might also have been something on um US Gen Webs. US yeah, that's what they pulled it up on here. Oh great. That's the link to it. So Okay. Thank you guys so much for that. Excellent. Mm -hmm. yes. Yep, we're we're always learning new things. So it tickled the edge of my brain. I haven't been. Yep, it's on US Gen Web. So mm -hmm. fantastic. Thank you guys. Um, so we have just a couple more questions, and then we'll wrap up because um, it is it is about that time. Um, what areas does the diocese cover? Uh, parishes. Um, I guess the archdiocese. Really? Yeah, so the Archdiocese consists of um, Orleans, the Archdiocese of New Orleans is Orleans, Jefferson, Plaquemines, St. Bernard, St. Charles, St. John the Baptist, St. Tammany, and Washington parishes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I see all these links. I'm sorry I kept on talking, even though you guys were typing because I'm staying up higher. Okay, and this is, this is going to be the last, um, the last, uh, question. Um, my great-grandmother's two sons died with 
in two months of each other. They were one in three years of age. They're both buried in St. Louis cemeteries one and two. They are in separate tombs. I don't know the person who owned one of the tombs. That would be to that would be a cue to contact New Orleans Catholic cemeteries to find out. Yeah, that's that's who you want to contact. Mm -hmm. Tracy Dillon. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around. Um, and then they've put the, if anybody's interested to find yeah. the link for those yellow fever deaths um, in the chat window, people have put the, the, the mm -hmm. direct link. So thank you all for that. That's yes. fantastic. Yes, thank you guys. Um, perfect, yes. US Gen Web, which again, explore that website. There are tons of wonderful transcriptions of various records there. And of course we use it um, that's where you find the additional New Orleans obituary indexes is through US Gen Web's subsite as well. And I just want to add, um, like, all of you have so much valuable information. If you ever have something like the yellow fever list that you think I might be interested in, please send it to me because I I don't know everything and I'm always learning and I would love to continue learning. So I'm anything that you all have um, cemetery related, I would love to have access to if you think maybe I, I'm not unaware of it. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Um, uh, and last question, can you publish chat Q&A? Um, there's no real, real way to publish the answers, unfortunately, because we're not typing them. Um, but they're in the recordings. They yeah. are in the recording, yeah. We'll always have the record. The recording will be up on um, Tuesday. Uh, this this final recording will be up on Tuesday. I guess let's let's do the last the last thing we'll do today is we'll go to the YouTube website where all the sessions are. Um, so if you just Google YouTube space NOLA I, um, archives NOLA library. So as you can see here, YouTube archives NOLA library is what I've typed in my Google search bar. This is us right here. Archives, NOLA Library. Please, please like and subscribe. But as you can see lined up here, we have all the sessions thus far. You can watch all of them. You can skip around as needed. Um, and, uh, you know, we're working on other, um, you know, additional list of genealogy, um, genealogy videos, uh, videos specifically about us, you know, stuff like that. Please like and subscribe. Um, take a look uh, and follow, follow additional, um, you know, local archives as well. I think we all appreciate it and we're all definitely moving into the YouTube realm now um, with uh, how much sort of stuff we've been doing it from, from, um, from inside buildings and from home since we haven't been doing gatherings anymore. Amanda, but, one thing that may be yeah. helpful for them, if, can you go ahead and add the yellow fever um, link to our yes. session links for this session yes. so that way everyone yeah. can have I'll it? That. I think I'll... that might be a good solution okay. to this because sure. I know. I will definitely do that. Okay. okay. Yes, I will. I will make sure to add. This is the initial right here. Uh, wait, am I missing it? I can send it to you. I have it open, so. I have three different links. Oh, death epid. Okay, so yeah, it's this last one. Thank you, thank you, S. Wes. Okay, well, <laughs> this has been wonderful. Um, we're uh, the YouTube link is awkwardly long. That's why I recommend. <laughs> so until we get 100 subscribers, this is our URL, um, uc9qwy1. So as you can see, impossible to remember. Um, if you if all subscribe, subscribe right now, they'll get to 100. Uh -huh. so. If you all subscribe right now, they'll <laughs> yeah, get to 100. Right here, subscribe <laughs> Everyone right, right here. now. Yep, to, to our channel. Um, we could change this long gobbledygook into Archives NOLA Library. So it would be youtube.com slash Archives NOLA Library instead of this. <laughs> but, but they do require 100 subscribers first. So please like and subscribe. <laughs> but that being said, um, I, what, I, what I did um, initially was I Googled YouTube Archives NOLA Library to get here. So as you can see in my Google search bar here, YouTube archives, NOLA library.
and that got directly to ours. Of course, um, the links to all of the videos are also in the program website at archives.nolalibrary.org. Like just, there's multiple ways you can access these things, whatever you're most comfortable with. So. And then just a shameless plug right now, really fast. If any of, we are gonna have the blessing of the graves this year um, for November 1st, we are gonna have that, or we require everybody to wear masks and practice social distancing. But I really hope some of you will be able to be out in the cemeteries. I'll be probably in St. Rock number one that day. So if any of you are there, please come up and introduce yourselves. I would love to meet, meet you all. And it's just a great day for everyone to be out in the cemeteries and meet other families who also have um, family members and friends interred within them. Excellent, excellent. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I don't know how to wrap this up with y'all, but I want to say that it has been a wonderful time. Um, we've, we've enjoyed every minute of it and I can't wait to do something like this again. Um, I know we'll all be working on stuff in the future and we'll make sure to let you all know through any of the avenues we've mentioned. And uh, please keep following us. We'll be having stuff coming in the coming months. Um, you know, Zoom, Zoom webinars like this that we also record and put on the channel. Um, we'll try to build a, a whole collection of information for you all about our resources. And um, again, we love working with you all, um, Heather, Kimberly, and Katie. This has been this has been incredible. You guys have just um, been wonderful and given so much incredible information um, to present to the patrons. We're it's happy to get it. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thanks for hosting us, Amanda. Yeah. No problem. Anytime. We, when, whenever we're ready for the next <laughs> one, let's do it. Um, it's been a fun you know, time. You know, we, we, we can always, um, we'd love to like do further sessions in the future. So yeah. yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for listening every week. And I just want to check that Terry got my, my message about how to sign up for um, an out of uh, area card. But um, just this is the very last thing we're going to do nolalibrary.org you can if you do not live in louisiana or like the southern louisiana area you can um go to services and library card information application and if you're not in the area you can email the circulation team at nolalibrary.org uh about getting a non-resident card which is 50 dollars annually and it'll give you it'll give you access to all of the databases that we mentioned in these in these sessions uh, locally New Orleans focused, if that's, you know, what you're looking for. And that, that I think is that. Thank y'all. And thank, thank you all, all for coming. <laughs> oh, we're going to say goodbye. Um, Bye everyone. Have a great Bye. day. Email us, call us. We're always ready to be in contact with y'all. And I've seen so many names of people that I miss seeing in real life. So Looking forward to hearing from you via email at any time. Okay. Bye, everybody.